We are here at the MG Motor India factory in Halol, where the first publication to have been given access to where MG products are made. And giving us a tour around the plant is none other than the president and managing director himself, Rajiv Chaba. Uh, Rajiv, uh, uh, thanks for showing us around. But before I start, uh, this must be a sort of a special feeling for you because many years ago you were heading this plant, but as the head of GM and now here you are as the head of uh, MG. So take us through that journey and, and, and what it felt like. Yeah, so welcome uh, almost to our plant. In fact, you are, the, you are the first journalist to visit our MG India factory. But I remember you have been here earlier when it was a GM factory too. So you can see the changes yourself. Well, I came so, here 25 years ago. 25 yeah. years back, my God. So, you know, so uh, as you can see probably, and we have made lots and lots of changes and uh, First time when I came here in 2017 in my new avatar as MG head, uh, you know, the plant, uh, GM had uh, closed down this plant that one of time. So uh, because of that, it was not in a great shape. Uh, but then we invested a lot and uh, uh, this plant is completely different than GM plant. Uh, if, if highlights I have to give you, uh, it has more automation, it has more gender diversity, more females working here in terms of greenness huge greenness like we are very very environmental friendly whether it's gas uh, uh, replacing lpg to png water recharging here water harvesting uh, ban of plastics as such in the plant inside the plant you know, a lot of greenery a lot of uh, you know green coverage we have got and also a lot of uh, you know, quality checks uh, i mean a lot of quality uh, check stations we have introduced here we have a new supplier park here we have a big global world-class training center here so a lot of investment has been done in many areas. So Rajiv, what would be interesting to understand from you, uh, you know, given the way the capacity situation is in India, there are companies taking over existing plants, everyone's, you know, hesitant to put up new, uh, full new greenfield facilities. Uh, when you take over an old plant, I mean, I'm looking at it, I can't recognize it. It looks like a brand new plant, to be honest. Uh, but what really needs to be done? What do you keep? What do you change? Obviously, the buildings and the structures remain the same because, uh, you know, that really doesn't have any impact on the products being made. So, just to get your sense, what really needs to be done? So, actually, you know, uh, almost everything, uh, uh, you know, you start from the, as you said, building structure, but then you, you need to uh, do the audits of even all the columns, you know, for rusting and things like that. The roofing, we, roof, roof mm -hmm. we changed here completely. A lot of columns had to be refurbished. We needed to, we, we, we got some experts on the civil structure to see what kind of life uh, is left in some parts of the building and how much we need to replace, how much we need to repair. So, it started with that basic. Then comes to, you know, other systems like fire fighting systems and all, we had to replace almost fully. Um, uh, uh, then you go shop by shop, like sh uh, because the product is different, so body shop is totally new here. Like paint shop more or less is same, but then we need to see the life of robots and things like that. Uh, and a and lot of, uh, you know, preventive maintenance or, 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 uh, uh, preve or, or the forecast of certain machines to make them smart machines to tell you about uh, what's going to fail. So, uh, I think there are lots and lots of audits in each and every area. So, more or less, the equipments are new. Uh, building is slightly old here. Even our admin building, you know, we have completely refurbished, changed, including furniture and everything. So, uh, like you said, it's difficult to make out it's an old plant or a new plant. Uh, guys have done a pretty good job here. Right. And, you know, just looking at uh, the plant right now, you've got uh, a wide range of products. Uh, uh, you know, is it a challenge uh, having this much flexibility to make them on the same line? I mean, you've got, uh, uh, you know, you've got a Gloucester, you've got an EV, uh, you've got two variants of the Hector. So, uh, is that flexibility something that's, uh, you know, comes at a cost? Does it even, let's say, reduce efficiency? You can't make in so much volume. I mean, what what's the kind of, uh, you know, to make this plant flexible? And you're going to have a fourth model, uh, which, uh, you know, you've touched upon. So, uh, uh, all being done over here. So, Hormuz, that's the beauty of our operations. Uh, you know, Gloucester uh, is a different line altogether. So, Gloucester is not on the common line. But uh, ZS EV and Hector and the fourth product which is going to come is going to be on the same line. Now, I think we need to appreciate, uh, um, in India at least, uh, to my knowledge, uh, EV and mainstream car are not produced in the same line. Uh, they are different dedicated lines, right? But here we have got this flexibility that we are making it on the same line. So, 
obviously as you know that uh, all the stations are not required for both the cars so we need to do the balancing uh, of stations and SOPs need to be different so uh, manpower allocation is different so you know all that team has achieved so good news is that three cars uh, ZSEV, the Hector, Hector Plus I take it as one family, Hector family and the fourth car are going to be on the same line uh, so that gives us absolute flexibility in terms of handling the market demand, customer demand and also from the manpower perspective. So it's pretty efficient for us from cost perspective and from manpower, uh, uh, manpower allocation perspective, it's very, very efficient. Right. You know, I want to talk a bit on the localization part because clearly this isn't an assembly plant. It's a full fledged manufacturing plant. You've got parts coming from all over, obviously a lot coming from China. Uh, you've got power trains, uh, the diesel engine coming from FCA and you've got a lot of uh, let's say local suppliers as well. So uh, just your sense, you know, integrating all these supply chains uh, and especially given the issues that there are on disruptions and supply, how challenging is it right now? And also you are just maxed out on your capacity as well. So, uh, I mean, is managing the whole supply chain been the difficult part right now? So many questions in one question. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, from a localization perspective and parts perspective, let me let me say it. Uh, let me let me clarify certain things. You know, um, in Hector, uh, you know, if you take diesel Hector, more than 80 percent, 84 percent is localized. And in petrol also, it's more than 55, 60 percent localized. Right. When we say localized, we have the components coming from the best suppliers of the country. And this whole localization thing depends upon um, the global sourcing, what we do, like any other multinational. So it's a global sourcing. And so we have some imports coming from China, as you said, some electronics and some uh, some mod modules are coming from China for sure. Some components are coming from Europe, a lot of semiconductors and all actually and chips are coming from Europe, you know. And then we have a lot of local suppliers and you name the top local suppliers, right from Lumax to Caparo to, to, to Munjals and Tata's and, and, and you name it, all, all are supplying to us, uh, wiring harnesses, wiring harness and, and the whole stamping all the steel, 100% steel components are sourced either in the plant, made in the plant or, or, or sourced locally from India. So we have two big presses here. So we are doing a lot of stamping here. We do hemming here inside the operation. Normally people do uh, outsourcing. So hemming is done internally. Uh, we have a supplier park here. So we are encouraging a lot of suppliers to come to Halol. So supplier park is supplying us almost 25% of our components, which you probably saw outside. So, you know, so, so huge localization. So it's, it's, it's a proper manufacturing plant, as I'm sure you would see. Um, also, you know, one thing more I want to say that actually we have taken one more step, which we are going to do it right now as we speak. 10% more localization we are doing it. So we are challenging the team, even some electronics, even some other modules which we are importing right now can be localized. So we are going to spend more than 200 crores uh, to help vendors. We have got a program with MSME sector right now. We are going to support them. So we are spending a lot of energy and money on additional localization on Hector this year. Right. Uh, Rajiv, you are looking long term on localization. Uh, quite clearly, Stamping, that's a big deal if you're doing 100% stamping 100 over here. here yeah. but I think the other big one is is powertrain. Now, mm. let's be honest, let's say petrol comes from abroad, maybe from China and diesel comes from uh, uh, FCA in India. Do you think eventually you need to be doing your own powertrain uh, locally? And, uh, you know, yeah. we'll come to the capacity question later. Do you think that's really uh, the final goal? So, Harmas, you're exactly right. And I would say uh, this whole journey evolves, right? And we are... We are still pretty new in this country. Isn't it? Uh, this plant uh, plant is old, but we started doing uh, we started uh, producing the cars only one and a half years back or so. You know, so and 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 I'm sure you will appreciate that we have started at a very decent localization of average 70 percent plus on hectare, which is which is damn decent. And this year, eight to ten percent more we are going to do it. So except powertrain, more or more or less stuff is going to be uh, localized in powertrain also. Uh, diesel powertrain, we are buying it from Pune, uh, from FC plant, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and petrol powertrains we are importing. Now, for powertrain to get localized or do assembly here, you need, a huge you need some volume. Uh, luckily, the way the cost economics works in India, you don't require 200,000. I mean, even up to 50,000, I think, units, you can do the localization. So, it's on the cards right now, though we are not doing it. But as we go forward, it, it is on the cards. So, what you're looking at is full powertrain localization at some point is part of the plan. We would definitely look at that, yeah. Right. And, you know, uh, just want to talk a little bit on transmissions. Uh, uh, on uh, you, you, You've just launched the CVT variant uh, of the uh, 
uh, Hector and you've got the DCT. Uh, obviously, quick to react like that. I mean, one wouldn't expect you to be giving two transmission options for the uh, same engine. So, just your thoughts on that. I mean, is it something that's come out of customer feedback? Uh, uh, I think more than that, uh, you know, uh, if you see uh, what we are trying to do on Hector, we are trying to give uh, options to customer and different choices and uh, and then try to maximize on one one platform which gives you volumes and then basis that you can do a lot of localization right. and you can do some more cost savings right so that's the bigger picture and uh, just to substantiate that uh, and to reinforce what we have been doing is we have got five seater six seater seven seater we have got interior choices we have got petrol and diesel and petrol not dct and cbt so why two automatic transmissions see dct as you know is for those customers uh, or for that kind of usage where you have a little bit of combination of highway and city tra traffic and you want some more sportiness, uh, some more engaging experience. So that's DCT. CVT more stop and go city traffic type conditions. You, practically, you may get more fuel efficiency in CVT, right? Though, though if you do the lap test, in, more in, or less In real equal. world, it's right. CVT is a bit right. more efficient. Right. Yeah. So CVT in real world is more efficient in your words. And, and so I think that gives customer a choice, you know, so, so that's what we are trying to do right now that maximize uh, maximize uh, or rather give a lot of choices to customer and in, in turn maximize the volumes in the segment the, the point i was trying to get at why i brought that up is a kind of flexibility i mean to suddenly give a transmission option which one wasn't expecting uh, the zscv also uh, you know a, a battery upgrade as as you had said so uh, are you geared for uh, let's say faster life cycle changes uh, going forward. Uh, you know, you've got the flexibility. Sometimes you've not invested too much in the manufacturing side. So, uh, you know, you've got that kind of balance uh, between how much you actually manufacture and how much, uh, right. you know, you've got uh, got flexibility on your side. So, I think, uh, uh, or rather, let me say it this way, aren't we doing lots of things which were unexpected in the, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. in the market in general? Absolutely. Whether it is for customer or dealers yeah. Or, yeah. or like employees, I think, and, and one of our mantra is try to do a little bit more than expectations, That's right? right? And I'm sure, you know, audience would agree that uh, we are trying to do something more than, you know, uh, whatever they have expected from a traditional mainstream player. So here, uh, actually, you raise an important point that uh, there's a cost uh, to, to all these choices, right? So, you know, there's a cost we incur. So I think this will stabilize at some point of time, uh, you know, and... Uh, also, we are being very, very agile and very, very quick to react to any market conditions. Uh, and that's our strength. That's our beauty. Uh, we want to maintain that. Uh, so you will keep seeing uh, faster introductions from our side. Life cycle is too early for me to talk about because all our products are fresh. And, and one thing uh, which you haven't said, but in my words, I would say that we are very conscious of refreshing the product cycle at a very fast pace. Uh, but there's a cost to it. So at some point of time, we need to balance it out. Right. Okay, great. So, Rajiv, what we're going to do is let's take a walk down the assembly line. Uh, I'd love to see, you know, how different it is from what I had uh, seen it uh, over two decades ago. It looks like a completely sure. new plant. I do remember some of the layout brings back memories, but uh, great to see that it's really buzzing and uh, looks like you are maxed out in capacity here. We'll talk about capacity in a bit. Sure. So, I'd love to show the plant and let's my go. team members also will join you. Absolutely. And, 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 uh, So, Rajiv, uh, obviously the paint shop, uh, very critical part of it, uh, but I think uh, what you had said is that uh, there are a lot of uh, lady women workers in this, something which is seen to be a man's job, but uh, clearly uh, uh, we've seen, uh, I think, a lot of uh, uh, ladies, I, I think it's a high proportion, so just give us some numbers on uh, yeah, you know, so the Yeah, so I think, uh, I think this is one topic, yes, yeah, so this is one topic which is close to our heart. And, and, and we decided right from the day one that we are going to have some differentiation in form of gender diversity too. So I'm happy to say that we are 31% uh, uh, gender diverse right now in, in here, uh, like 31% females are there uh, as employees. We are taking it to 40% by June, you know? And it means in certain shops, like we have more than 50% female employees already. Like in paint shop, we have more than 50%. In quality, we have more than 50%. Even in body shop, we have 20%. Press shop, we have 12%. So, you know, and certain operations like tire assembly, you will see, or you would have seen already, 
that is 100% um, uh, female uh, operators. And I'm happy to say, especially in paint shop, like the two painters here, Gayatri and Jayashree, they're the first painters in the country, lady painter in the country, right? And they have come from a very different kind of a background and they're able to do it. And we are training more three or four ladies painters. So this is really pretty good feeling. And, uh, and I think uh, the team is very proud of it and team wants more and more female operators now. In fact, we have got a hostel also now for, for, for our girls here. So overall, pretty good. One, one more point I want to tell you interestingly, in the, in the body shop when we started, uh, there's a lot of uh, myth and resistance that you know how female welders are going to do the job, can they hold the gun properly, this and that, welding quality. And guess what? Uh, we did some blind tests between a, a, a male welding and a female's welding. Uh, what they had done and female welding was found to be much more better, better quality. You know, so a lot of yeah. myths we are breaking and thanks to Gayatri and Jayashree, uh, uh, they are breaking the glass ceiling of auto right. industry, like in painting and welding. And right, right, right. So, uh, in body shop, and uh, robotization. Obviously, you can't have too much robotization. Uh, you need the flexibility, also the capacity is not there for that. So, is the body shop also completely new from... Uh, uh, so, yeah, this body shop is new. Uh, but some of the equipments like robots and all uh, are old. Yeah. Uh, so some we had to replace, but most of the robots are old. Uh, we have almost 2,500 melt spots, you know, in Hector body. And 30% of that is done through robots and 70% is manual. Right. You know, so that's the kind of an automation we have got. And as you can see again, uh, very, very proud I'm uh, from the team perspective that even in this station, as an example, you can see you have your male and female on the body shop. And this, this is kind of an area where typically you will not see female engineers, female workers, associates on the line. But they are doing even the body shop job and they do the welding and everything. Right, because typically uh, handling a robot requires a certain amount of strength. So, I mean, you know, not meaning to sound uh, sexist, but it's typically uh, a man's job, but clearly they've done a, they seem to be managing it quite well. So, here, what we say is obviously, you know, to work in the body shop, you need to have certain physical criteria in terms of height and weight and things like that. And whoever qualifies, male or female, they can work here. So, we don't differentiate because it's a female, uh, you can't work on the body shop. And that's what we have challenged right from the day one. And as I was mentioning it um, earlier, that we did some even blind spa, blind testing on the welding quality. And then male male welder welding quality versus female welding quality, we found female welding quality is better. So we say, okay, there has to be a criteria for selection. And whoever qualifies that criteria, male or female gets the job. So Raji, we've come to the end of the line, <laughs> literally, well, at least for the final assembly, that's what I meant. Uh, but clearly what one, one can see is this place is chock-a-block, you've run out of capacity. Long term, that's going to be an issue, but uh, short term, how are you planning to fix this? Because uh, clearly for the for future models, uh, this is not enough. So, you know, uh, you're right, Harmas. Right now, we can do around four, four and a half thousand cars a month. And this is what we are maxed at this, at this point of time. Um, we have second shift, as you would have noticed, in certain shops, wherever the balancing is not proper. Uh, especially the paint shop is a constraint. So, you know, so that's how we have two shifts operation there. In other sh other lines, we have single shift operation. We are also providing overtime uh, and sometimes we have to work on Saturdays. Uh, before we introduce the, sec uh, the fourth car uh, or the second mainline car, which we know that we are going to do it uh, third quarter of this year. So we need uh, to increase capacity to seven to 8,000 a month. And that's what we are focusing on right now. So hopefully by September, October, we should be producing seven to 8,000 cars a month, including the fourth car. So it means we can go up to 80 or 90,000 cars a year. We are also working on expanding the capacity further to probably 100,000 plus in this plant itself, um, uh, because Gloucester line is separate. Uh, so, so that also adds to certain volume. So hopefully, uh, by next year, we should be able to produce more than 100,000 cars in this plant. But after that, we need to think about phase two, which is uh, another plant. Right. Uh, but uh, let's uh, uh, talking about this plant. You said 100,000 capacity. That's almost, well, 40, 50 percent more. 
but uh, where are you going to put in the capacity? I mean, is there space over here? Uh, is it going to be a completely different line or right. uh, an additional so, line as well? So, uh, so some lines are extra lines. As an example, Gloucester is already a separate line, which is not counted in this uh, buy-off uh, line where we are standing right now. It's a separate uh, buy-off also for Gloucester. Uh, uh, body shop, you will see, we'll have a separate body shop for the next car line. Uh, so, some shops are uncommon but paint shop is common and paint shop so, remains so a and paint shop is always a restriction isn't it so how shop, do you get your paint constraint? shop from the current uh, 60000 to 100000 so what happens is as you know we define uh, we define the line capacity by jobs per hour so certain shops are 20 jobs per hour certain paint shop let's say pre treatment is 13 jobs per hour you know so then we are going to max uh, we, we are going to max it by utilizing all the assets 24 hours so paint shop may run almost three shifts a day Whereas other shops will run two shifts a day. So by having two complete shifts in rest of the line, three shifts in paint shop, we can go up to 100,000. Right. And you know, just last few questions on, on this plant. Uh, clearly, it's got, well, some advantages. Uh, obviously, the advantage is cost. Uh, you know, the plant was already existing. But a few challenges in terms of uh, logistics, port, um, and let's say even the supplier park. Perhaps which has been developed with Sanand, uh, you know, kind of uh, developing in the uh, vicinities. So, just your thoughts on uh, these couple of issues. I think situation in terms of the whole ecosystem, uh, you know, uh, of, of uh, suppliers and capabilities, skills, manpower has improved a lot in Gujarat in the last 10 years or so. So, so life is different now in MG than it used to be in GM because uh, the suppliers were not all around. So, now, you, as you said, we have got good uh, capability and good uh, ecosystem from Sanand, which is not far off from here. It's like 150 kilometers from here. Uh, within Halol also, because of the robustness of our operations, lots of suppliers have come here. We have got our own supplier park. So four suppliers are on the on the premises, which was not the case earlier when factory was you know run by GM. Uh, and then uh, also we have lots of suppliers who are coming from NCR area and South India to set up capability here because when we are talking about 100,000 capacity uh, and 100,000 manufacturing in the next two years or so on a yearly basis, I think it's a very sustainable continuous business. So suppliers are seeing opportunity and they are coming here. Uh, mind it, to best of my knowledge, uh, GM produced max, I think, 60,000 cars here. So we are going to test the system for 100,000 for the first time. Uh, you know, we are the third hand. It was Isuzu, GM and then MG. So, you know, uh, pretty proud of establishing this whole thing and the team is doing and some of the members we have met today, uh, team is doing an outstanding job and overall plant is very well oiled machinery. Right. Well, you know, on that very positive note, the fact that you are increasing capacity and that's just the first step. Uh, second plant is, uh, you know, going to be uh, the next big thing. But uh, for now, uh, you know, it's good to see that this place is humming. It's really a beehive of activity and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Hormuz, and thanks for visiting. And I hope uh, you got a pretty good impression of what exactly we are doing it here. Really, it has been quite an eye-opener. Thanks very much. Thank you.